Once upon a time, there lived a woman by the name of Jen Crisser. Jen was just a human woman, a mere mortal, but she was very ambitious. She saw the demigods on Mount Olympus and she envied them. In desperation, she sought the advice of the oracle. Hail, sacred oracle, she said. Yes, said the oracle. How do I get clout and wealth? asked Jen Crisser. The oracle thought for a while and then said, Scandalize, trigger, troll, for every arrow and stone cast your way will please the holy algorithm. If you succeed, if the engagement is high, your sacrifice will not go unnoticed. You will be rewarded with immortal clout. Praise be the algorithm. Guys, before we begin, a quick announcement from Jen Crisser and her janky hairline. Subscribing to this channel is a very cool aesthetic. Hi, hello. I am back at it again with my budget props and mediocre lighting. And there are no costumes this time because I realized that what I really care about in this video and in life is not looking repulsive. So. That is the bar I'm choosing to set for myself. Now, I know that cancel culture is not exactly the freshest of topics. ContraPoints, my favorite YouTuber and a huge influence on me, made an epic hour and a half long video on the topic, so you would think I could just let it lie. But I didn't want to make a video about the moral issues around canceling, or about the legitimacy of any particular cancelings, or about the experience of getting canceled. I just wanted to make a video about the effectiveness of this um, practice. I would define canceling like this. It is when people try to deplatform or demonetize a public person or brand for some perceived or actual misdeed by applying public pressure, usually online. And it happens to be one of the internet's favorite things, right up there with porn and frog TikToks. As the New York Times wrote, almost everyone worth knowing has been cancelled by someone. Bill Gates is cancelled, Gwen Stefani and Erica Badu are cancelled, despite his relatively strong play in the World Cup, Cristiano Ronaldo has been cancelled, Taylor Swift is cancelled, and Common is cancelled, and, needless to say, Kanye West is cancelled too. The goal of cancelling someone is to make them obsolete to make them go away. And so many people have been canceled by now that you would think there'd be no celebrities left anymore. But no, they're still very much with us and clearly panicking because Miss Rona came on the world stage and made all of them instantly irrelevant. So the topic today is that one of the several problems with cancel culture is that it does not work the way it's supposed to. Most people who get canceled do not become obsolete. In fact, if anything, the opposite seems to happen. I think that if an alien were to come to Earth and in a wildly misguided effort to assimilate start watching YouTube drama channels, they would assume that canceling means a psychologically damaging but very cost-effective way to leverage one's personal brand to a new level of exposure. And here is why I think this. Reason 1. Canceling, Polarization and Expansion In social psychology, the thinking is that in any group discussion, two common dynamics may emerge. Scenario 1 is, a popular opinion appears and everyone just sort of gloms onto it, except for a few non-conformist, anti-social heroes who hang around on the outskirts muttering. Scenario 2 is polarization, which is when during the discussion, everyone's opinions end up moving farther and farther away from the moderate viewpoints they started out with towards the extremes, until everyone is screaming at each other and everyone is a cuck and a snowflake and a Nazi, which is a completely theoretical scenario and not at all what is happening right now in every area of American life, endangering the principles and institutions that made America, from my vantage point in Russia at least, seem like a rather admirable country. I'm sure you've seen this kind of polarization happen in arguments before. You start out from a reasonable place. Hey, um, would you mind doing the dishes? And then it gets personal. No, no, no. It's just that when you leave them there, it kind of feels like you're expecting me to do them. And then it morphs into something else. Excuse me? So, because you work harder than me, I should be doing your dishes? And finally, I will not be gaslit into doing the dishes. This is violence. This is abuse. 
Social media, which Mr. Mime over here would like to remind us is all about connecting people, has magnified these kind of group discussion dynamics. Polarization is everywhere online. There are too many examples to bring up. So instead, let's illustrate this with Steve. This is Steve. Steve is somewhat famous and it has become publicly known that Steve has done something bad. Not criminally bad, but something that either a very large or very vocal part of the internet considers bad. First, polarization. Some people tweet, hey, the thing Steve did was bad. Then other people, who maybe worry they're a little bit like Steve on some level, or who maybe just really enjoy Steve's art house movies, respond. Hey, no, it wasn't that bad. Then the first people get incensed and say, Excuse me? No, what Steve did was horrible. It was terrible. It was no good. In fact, no one should ever listen to what Steve has to say ever again. And if you do, you are not a frog. You're a toad, just like Steve. Then expansion. The people who were not part of the discussion see all of this. And because of the escalated nature of the conversation and its scope, they feel compelled to join in. Some of them say, Wow, this reaction seems out of proportion to Steve's bad thing. Others say, Wow, the Steve defenders, their sheer number, has made me speak up because I cannot stand by and watch this total toad Steve be defended like this. And they say all of this, even though literally the day before, none of them had a single fuck to give about Steve or about the thing Steve did. Then there's another kind of invisible part of all of this. Let's call it the empathy backlash. This is when the silent majority, the people who still aren't tweeting somehow, but are scrolling, see what is happening to Steve and to the people talking about Steve. Now, perhaps many of them recognize that the thing Steve did was bad and accept that it needs to be discussed and even discussed publicly. But still, they see the wildly escalating accusations and a part of them feels sorry for Steve. Perhaps this sorrow for Steve will make them less likely to call out other Steves in the future. Perhaps it'll make them go and surreptitiously donate to Steve's Patreon as a silent gesture of support. Or maybe it'll just make them agree less with Steve's accusers than they did before this whole situation began. Meanwhile, Steve himself is not doing well either. Certainly none of this is doing much to actually change his mind, despite what he said in his very prompt apology with tasteful crying. I am human and I'm going to make mistakes along the way, but I'm going to do my best to learn from those mistakes and try my hardest to be a better human for you guys. You mean the world to me. Of course, it's not like anyone was setting out to change Steve's mind with all of this. But still, Steve, who in our imaginary scenario is still very much in possession of his platform, even if it is besieged, is now quite possibly more entrenched in his toad-like beliefs. He's entrenched because if all of the people who are telling him what he did was wrong are also calling him a toad, then for Steve to admit that what he did was wrong would also mean admitting to being a toad. And the moral of this story is that no frog wants to be a toad, I guess. So overall, the results of theoretical Steve's canceling are 1. Everybody knows Steve's name. 2. The people who called Steve out have escalated in their accusations and are now sharing opinions about Steve and all the other suspected Steves out there that are disingenuous and unconvincing. 3. Steve is fuming, quite possibly more entrenched in his toadness and still very much in possession of his platform. 4. The people who quite possibly might have remained silent on this issue or done something more useful with their time have been roped into the discussion. And 5. The people who are maybe a little bit like Steve, maybe some of them are a little bit toads, are now either more entrenched in these beliefs or too scared by Steve's public exoriation to ever bring these beliefs up and maybe learn something new and maybe change their opinions. So the situation is not ideal. And as always, the only people who are doing okay are the ones who are off Twitter. Oh, and one more thing, the winner of this whole Steve debacle is of course the algorithm because the algorithm got a lot of clicks out of Steve's canceling and the algorithm happens to really really, really like clicks. The algorithm is interested in clicks only in service of the public. The goal is to create the most engaging experience for the user. Well, you know what? Maybe we are too fucking engaged. Reason two.
canceling as unintentional awareness campaign. Please think of a few celebrities or just any individuals in the public eye who you only recently learned about. In what context did you first hear about them? I'm willing to bet that at least one or two of them appeared on your feed because of some kind of controversy surrounding them. For example, I became aware of YouTuber Logan Paul when he caused outrage by posting footage of a dead body he found in the Japanese suicide forest. I became aware of YouTuber James Charles when he was accused of predatory behavior. And I met my current boyfriend when he accidentally shared a nude of his in a blog post he wrote for the Wall Street Journal. Just kidding, I don't read the Wall Street Journal. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Here's another thing. If you go into Google Trends and you look at the most Googled people over the last few years, almost all of them will have had some kind of major controversy attached to their name in the same year. For example, these were the most Googled people in the US in 2019. NFL player had sexual assault allegations made against him and then lots of drama with him changing teams like three times. B-list, honestly more like C-list probably, TV actor who staged a hate crime against himself and then was embroiled in the endless investigation of said hate crime. Beauty YouTuber was involved in beauty guru infighting over hair vitamins and things featuring lots of ominous voice memos. Point is, most of the people on this list are not on here because they were the most accomplished or popular people of 2019, but simply because they were involved in some type of scandal that was covered so exhaustively that eventually enough people ended up Googling them to find out who the hell they are to place them on this list. Now, I used to work for an ad agency, which was very 50s of me, except this was in Russia, so it was more like very 90s of me, because I don't know if you've noticed, but Russia exists on its own, completely separate timeline. <sighs> so, I was working for this agency, and among the stuff we did for clients, there were these things called awareness campaigns. And let me tell you, my bosses would have sold their souls for an awareness campaign that landed one of our clients on one of those most Googled lists. That is a level of exposure that most people, and by people I mean corporations, would be willing to pay insane amounts of money for. Now, awareness is not necessarily about liking or disliking something. It's just about going from not knowing about it to knowing about it. If you were to um, um, defecate in my bed, I would have a very strong opinion about this, but to have that opinion, I would first have to become aware of the poop under my pillow. And specifically in situations where the choices are numerous and the barriers to entry are low, awareness is the name of the game. For example, let's say you're in a supermarket and you're trying to buy laundry detergent for the first time ever because you've somehow never done your own laundry before. You sheltered little shit. You look at the wall of detergents and you pick Tide and you're picking it simply because you recognize the word Tide and you recognize the combination of blue and orange that comprises the Tide brand identity. You pick Tide simply because it's familiar. It's the one you're aware of. If you were choosing something more expensive or important, you might put more thought into it. But this is detergent and you feel like everyone is looking at you and you feel like everyone knows this is the first time you've ever done laundry. So you just grab the one that all the teens like shoving down their throats and you run. Consuming information online is kind of like buying laundry detergent. Because one, there are always numerous options, and two, if you pick something you don't end up liking, it won't cost you much. Little known fact, the internet is actually just an oversized target hidden in deep jersey. So, you're strolling down YouTube's lively aisles, and suddenly, you see a familiar name and face. Now, the reason they are familiar is that yesterday you'd scrolled through like 1100 articles about this guy. And you remembered that the articles were about something disturbing, like a dead body in a forest. But of course, you didn't click on any of them because you're not going to stoop to reading articles about YouTubers. So you notice that specific thumbnail and you think, huh, funny. I was just seeing all those articles about this guy yesterday. What a coincidence. So you click and it turns out he's a funny guy and he's good looking, and his content is engaging. 
So now you're not just someone who's aware of Logan Paul. You're also someone who maybe kind of likes Logan Paul's content. Point is, scandal results in massive amounts of coverage. And this coverage, with enough PR savvy, can be turned into a springboard from which the target of the canceling, or the victim, depending on how you feel about them, can reach new audiences and even new career paths. Like, for example, moving from vlogging into professional-ish boxing and podcasting. Of course, I'm assuming that part of the reason Paul pivoted away from YouTube after the Suicide Forest video was simply the fact that he had gotten kicked out of Google Preferred, so his videos were now earning less money on YouTube per view. But still, the thing is, two contradictory ideas can sometimes be true at the same time. And I think that Paul moved into podcasting and boxing after the Suicide Forest video, both because his videos were earning less money on YouTube and because at that specific point in time, he had more eyes on him than ever before. Of course, not every PR scandal converts into an awareness campaign. There are some caveats. For example, if an ancient and bloated media empire that is about to collapse under its own weight anyway gets cancelled, then that can be the straw that breaks the Ellen's, sorry, camel's back. But of course, ancient and bloated empires are typically headed towards oblivion anyway, so that's caveat one. Caveat two is, if your canceling results in actual institutions and organizations turning away from you, that can make the deplatforming a lot more real. But still, if public interest stays with you, and I would argue that furiously tweeting about someone is not turning away from them, then eventually the sponsors and gatekeepers come crawling back because money. Third caveat, the more family friendly your public image and persona are, the easier it is for your canceling to seriously damage your brand. But of course, one could argue that then you could just go down the whole good girl gone bad route or whatever. Fourth caveat, if the canceling is connected to an actual crime, well, first of all, then you're not getting canceled, you're getting prosecuted. Unless you move to Europe. But most cancelings don't have to do with the criminally reprehensible, they have to do with the morally reprehensible. And when it comes to discussing morals, everyone always agrees and everyone gets along. Reason three, canceling as intentional awareness campaign. There is one more category involved in the Steve situation that I haven't mentioned yet. These are the people who don't care about anything but themselves. They're just watching, and some of them are smart enough to recognize that outrage is one of the algorithm's preferred delicacies. Now this problem, I think, is maybe the worst and most dangerous problem with cancel culture. The gist of it is that, as with everything else, the ravenous, amorphous blobfish that is capitalism has found a way to exploit public outrage in the interest of its own gluttony. And the people among us who are best at harnessing the blobfish in the interest of their own gluttony, most notably Sylvester McMonkey McBean and our royal family, were some of the first to figure this out, which is why now we're all stuck looking at their unnaturally tanned faces every day. I'd been hearing the expression outrage marketing for years now, but when I looked it up in all of my handy little marketing databases, I couldn't find any good case studies. I guess this is because if you admit to being outrageous on purpose, let alone submit a case study of your outrage campaign, you run the risk of snuffing out the outrage. And we wouldn't want that now, would we? The algorithm harbors no ill will. The goal is only optimization. Oh God, shut up. Chicken McNuggets are also optimized to be infinitely consumable, but that doesn't mean they're good for us. Sorry. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that examining outrage marketing is difficult because it's all a bit of a Schrodinger's cat situation. Anything these reality TV alumni say can be either A, a strategic exploitation of the public, or B, sincere and accidental stupidity, and you never know which it is at any given moment. Let me give you an example of what I suspect but can't prove was outrage marketing. In the summer of 2019, Kim Kardashian West launched a brand of shapewear and she named her brand Kimono. For days, the internet was flooded with people being outraged over Kim's obviously obnoxious and super disrespectful name choice. I mean, she said she chose the word because it has Kim in it and to hell with the history of an entire people. 
It was a massive deal. The mayor of Kyoto tried to publicly reason with Kim and explain how the kimono is an important part of Japanese culture. At one point, there was even a paragraph about Kim's underwear on the Wikipedia page for kimonos. Nobody was happy with Kim trying to wedge herself into Japanese culture tighter than her shaping thongs will lodge themselves up your ass crack. Okay, so next, Kim waited for three days and then emerged like Jesus from the cave. And she said that she'd heard and she'd listened and she was sorry and she was grateful. Shortly after that, the brand renamed itself Skims. Now, Skims is objectively a much better name for a brand of underwear than kimono. First of all, simply because the word Skims has more associations with underwear. Also, it's much easier on search engine optimization because it's not being used by everyone else to signify a different thing. And finally, Skims is a much cleverer incorporation of the name Kim because it sounds like Kim's, which it is. It is Kim's. It's a Kim's world. Everything is Kim's, unless, of course, it is Kylie's. Surely Kim Kardashian could have avoided this. I mean, she has a team. She hired plenty of experienced marketing professionals to work on her underwear. There's such a thing as polls and focus groups for fuck's sake. I refuse to believe that this lady who plays the internet like Yo-Yo Ma plays the cello did not realize what was going to happen if she named her brand of tummy tucking shorts kimono. Is this a conspiracy theory? Because that kind of thing is not allowed. No, this is not a conspiracy theory. The topic of nude panties is not important enough for there to be a conspiracy theory about it, okay? Anyway, my point is, I wonder if Kim didn't take the wave of outrage around cultural appropriation and surf it into another couple hundred million bucks. And this is dangerous. First of all, because public discourse matters. Even online public discourse sometimes matters because occasionally it can boil over into something really game-changing. The Me Too movement is important. Black Lives Matter is important. The continuing fight for LGBTQ rights is important. And not just for the people who directly benefit from these movements, but also for people stuck in countries with none of the liberties and dignities Americans enjoy, who get to see that at least somewhere these conversations are being had. Of course, it's not like other social justice movements haven't been co-opted by the blobfish in the past. But there's a difference between pointlessly and insincerely slapping a rainbow on the AT&T logo once a year and just completely poisoning all of public discourse by turning it into a covert marketing campaign. Outrage marketing undermines the rest of public discourse by giving it the halo of stupidity and greed. And secondly, this is dangerous because if being outrageous, especially being outrageous in a very controlled and calculated way, can get you more money and fame than almost any other behavior, then the people who rise to the top are the most soulless, conscienceless twats. The people who are callous enough and insulated enough to not care that almost everyone despises them and just use those hate-fueled clicks to buoy themselves onto the front pages of the internet and the top of mind of every person in this beleaguered country. And I'm not just talking about the Trumps and the Kardashians. Sure, most people don't earn money off making intentionally provocative statements online. But we all want those little dopamine hits we get when a post or tweet gets a big reaction. Some get that fixed by being outrageous and edgy, while others get it by rallying attacks on the outrageous and the edgy. And it's growing increasingly hard to discern the parts of internet culture wars that are fueled by sincere activism and beliefs and politics from the ones that are simply fueled by our species' insatiable hunger for acceptance and attention. You know likes and retweets feel really good. You know you want them sometimes more than to change someone's mind. You know you want them sometimes more than to be honest. You know you want them. You know it. Conclusion, also known as the disgustingly earnest part in which we talk about what can be done about all of this. Well, first of all, I think it would be really cool if we could all just stop posting disingenuous and outrageous things simply because we're jonesing for some likes. I have fixed the internet, problem solved. Secondly, I think it's important if we really care about issues to think about how to make our points convincing rather than alienating. It won't mean we're selling out, it won't mean we're on the wrong side, 
It'll just mean we're trying. Thirdly, I think it's important to recognize the sort of bad faith outrage spreaders out there and not fall for them. The trolls aren't relegated to the internet's underbelly anymore. They're in the White House and they're on TV. So, and finally, apart from what we can do, I think there's someone else who needs to think seriously about what can be done to change this. That's it guys, thank you so much for watching. Um, please subscribe or share this with someone or something so I have a reason to make more stuff like this. And if you like, you can support me on Patreon. And here are some gorgeous people who have done so. Subscribe to this channel if the vibes are unreal.